So based on some feedback, I've decided to redo a lot of my videos with more of a, an impromptu approach. I think a lot of people like that. At least that's the feedback that I was getting anyway. So what I'm going to do is just start from square one. I really wanted to redo chapter one and talk about the conceptualism in Christianity, the compartmentalized mindset and cognitive dissonance. This chapter is really about the psychology of coming into a new uh, understanding and, and processing the information that we're not familiar with. And I want to start off with a quote from a book that I've not read, but the quote itself um, has kind of been passed around, and it's by a guy named Franz Fanon, uh, Black Skin, White Masks. And what he has to say is very powerful. He says, sometimes people hold a core belief that is very strong. When they are presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It creates a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable called cognitive dissonance. And because it is so important to protect the core belief, they will rationalize, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with that core belief. And like I say in the beginning, um, everything that you read in this book has the potential to change the way you engage in everyday spiritual combat. Just because the, cop the topics in here, they're so controversial and so eye-opening. And a lot of this information is swept under the rug. I mean, if you try to talk about these things, uh, people will just often like kind of dance around it or revert to something else. And be like, why, why do we have to, what does this have to do with anything? What does this have to do with salvation or winning the lost? Things like that. So that's kind of what this chapter is about. Um, the, the chapters in this book, all the information, it, uh, the information is becoming more relevant. Uh, than the times than, than ever before you know the following chapters detail what a lot of people in what you may have heard referred to as the truther community a lot of this information is just commonly understood by a lot of people who are searching these things out doing a lot of investigation um, but if you can test and approve the information to be true then uh, you will receive the benefit of knowing kind of what to expect. Uh, maybe not specifically, but at least um, the an idea or an agenda behind uh, the, the world powers. Uh, the things I disclose in this book, it's it's been observed by a number of Christians in, in recent years, especially in the last five to ten years. Um, we, I've seen atheists come to Christ, agnostics, and whose their, their quest for truth it basically resulted in their conversions. So, um, and that goes back to the people who want to say a lot of these topics, what does it have to do with winning the lost? Well, I've seen quite a few testimonies too. Um, and there's going to be controversy that, that follows. If you want to discuss these topics, there's going to be controversy, and I think that's why a lot of people uh, just want to stay away from uh, new things, that, that things they've never heard before, things that sound new, things that are going to make them question the way they've been raised. If you're a Christian, uh, then you should know that Satan is a deceiver and a liar. He disguises himself as an angel of light, and what I submit in this book is that most professing Christians have never considered the depth of this reality. Uh, most of the time, they basically associate the devil's lies uh, with uh, his sly attempts to lure us into sin or something like that, um, which he does. I mean, I'm not downplaying that at all, but if, if your focus is on maybe those types of lies, um, then you're going to miss out on what the devil has done to blind the world from a lot of the more obvious realities. Things that we've just accepted as truth 
because it was what was presented to us. Uh, Mark Twain supposedly once said, I don't know if that is a definite source. I, I didn't find anything um, when I when I looked for this quote for who the originator was. It, but it's mostly attributed to Mark Twain, who simply said, it is easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. Wow. Uh, the writer of The Truman Show. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that movie, The Truman Show, Jim Carrey. Um, but one of the lines in that movie is, we accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. It's as simple as that. That's powerful. And uh, then there, I have another quote I'm coming up. But I, I believe this mindset to be true. I mean, this that's a that's a really good principle. Assuming that uh, some of my my listeners, I guess, or readers are familiar with the Truman Show, just assume or or uh, imagine that Truman represents humanity, and we are in pursuit of our Creator. While there's been a spiritual force that has targeted us as subjects of their deception, if we're living in a matrix of lies, uh, then it would only come naturally to embrace that reality unknowingly because deception partners with denial. I've said that I've written that in every one of my books. I say that like they're like millions, but I've written three books and I've said that in every one. So it has the potential to, to keep us paralyzed. Um, a lot of Christians today are in a state of paralysis. And even as early as the third chapter of the Bible, the devil is introduced as a cunning perpetrator. And we know this. His motive is to defile what God called good. And if he can convince us to accept an alternate reality, one that challenges God's design, then he's going to take whatever extremes necessary to do so. And that's why this book is called Exposing the Devil's Agenda Against God's Design. And that's what this is about. This, this book as a whole is exposing that agenda. It's not just a conspiracy book. It's not just, hey, let's look at this and look at this and come up with some theories. No, this actually is the backbone of everything. It, it exposes that plan or that, that entire that that um babylonian like it, the the tower of babel when it was like one people working together to overthrow god that's what this is it's ex it's exposing that um the content is based on you know the, the the very notion that satan is a deceiver and the father of lies and most christians understand this concept but ironically, the average Christian would have difficulty accepting if something they currently believe was a lie from the devil. So basically, they tend to believe the devil deceives others, but deny that we ourselves are subjects of deception. It's difficult for us to even consider the possibility that we are vulnerable to disinformation, which... It does raise a pr predicament for those who have embraced a certain lie or lies, if people believe lies. Um, if Satan's convinced Christians that a lie is the truth or that truth is a lie, then it's going to come naturally. Uh, it'll cause controversy or it'll, I mean, it'll raise feelings of defensiveness. When absolute truth is uncovered, there's going to be tension. According to... A lot of the researchers that I've studied after, it's a common observation. Uh, one guy I quote a lot in this book is Rob Skiba, and he said, willful ignorance is a result of cognitive dissonance. And I've added that to the book. Um, I love that quote because it goes right along with, um, it goes right along with the theme of this section. Uh, another quote uh, by Dr. Wayne Dyer. He said, the ultimate ignorance is the rejection of something you know nothing about and refuse to investigate. And I'm seeing a lot of that going on. A lot of people, 
um, getting all defensive when you start talking about something that they've just never heard before. They reject it, but they're not willing to look into it. Um, my, my wife and I are currently dealing with that with someone very close to us, um, just rejecting a, a lot of things that are happening and um, just not willing to even give it a thought. It's like, have you tested the spirits? Have you tried the spirits to see whether they are of God? Have you tested all things like the scripture says? And this kind of captures the nature of this entire journey. It introduces one of the most elementary principles going forward. Condemnation before investigation. What Rob Skiba talks about a lot in a lot of his videos. Uh, people are going, or they just condemn someone or something before they take the time to investigate it. And uh, in Proverbs, it even talks about this. Proverbs 18, 13, it says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And so this tendency to reject the unfamiliar, it's become more widely recognized in recent years, uh, especially in these lines of study and uh, the topics that I discuss in, in my book. In the field of psychology, it's known as cognitive dissonance. And I, I added that uh, phrase above if you heard the, the Rob Skiba quote, um, that's what cognitive dissonance is. We feel uncomfortable, even offended, when we hear an idea that challenges what we've been raised to believe. And I think Skiba does well to link cognitive dissonance with willful ignorance. And from the pattern that I've observed, the most common display of willful, willful ignorance comes straight from Christian communities. And I know because it, it's like it's something I personally dealt with. And that's why I'm talking about it. I mean, this this book is a journey. This this book is a it's a truth journal. This is a truth journal. And it I'm describing everything that went through my mind and I processed and as well as a lot of people that I've come to know in the past couple of years. The people who can't cope with controversial subjects, they tend to condemn us prematurely without volunteering any effort towards investigation. And in my previous book, um, I hammered out this principle as means of building my foundation. And I believe it's even more applicable to the discussion that this book brings to the table. All right. Um, knowing firsthand someone raised in church, I was. I have a church background, and there's no question in my mind. The following topics, the, the topics that I talk about are taboo i get it um it's it's not it's not typically something people want to discuss uh it's inconvenient information people don't want to hear this i should have titled this one what itching ears don't want to hear that was the title of my first book but um and consequently a lot of christians who hear these ideas, they often experience cognitive dissonance, uh, which in turn produces an unseemly form of resistance. Uh, and it's been, a, it's been an ongoing cycle among Christians for years. Um, there's a lot of diligent stewards out there remaining busy exposing these threats to the church. Um, but even though there are a lot of us trying to do that. We still face criticism from the very people that we're trying to protect uh, in efforts to make the church aware of Satan's cunning devices. Legitimate seekers such as myself um, and, and others that I've studied under were labeled disruptive by the church because of these topics. And ironically, some of the same truths that Scripture affirms turns out to be the very subjects that mainstream Christianity writes off as distractions just because the, the information in there is inopportune. It's inconvenient to their vision or their agenda or their, their goals, dreams, aspirations for the church, for their establishment, their organization. And... Some of you may think, what in the world is this guy talking about? Well, the further 
you read or listen to the, the videos, the more you're going to understand. Uh, during the autumn of 2018, uh, when I first began writing my manuscript, I became connected with a minister who was fired by the board of his church simply for looking into some of these issues. Nate Wolf, his unfortunate experience is now his testimony. Um, his circumstances have turned completely around, but through the situation, God opened the door for Nate to begin a new ministry called Fired for Truth. And it's kind of a double meaning, Fired for Truth, and he was literally fired for truth, just in case you didn't get that. It took me a minute. I, you know, I kept seeing fired for truth. I was starting to get connected to that. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul, who was unable to see the church in Thessalonica. He writes about it in his letter. Um, when he intended on visiting him, the church, he writes, but Satan hindered us in his letter. Okay, so in that situation, it seemed like everything was working against Paul, but God actually turned everything around. And I think I remember, I don't remember who was talking about this, but someone explained that if Paul wouldn't have, if he would have visited Thessalonica as he planned, then he wouldn't have written his epistle to them. And so consequently, we wouldn't be able to read about his experience since his letter wouldn't even exist. Now it's part of our Bibles. So you see, that's that's really neat. So like kind of, I guess, kind of in a similar way, Nate has taken an unfortunate situation and he's found a way to, to reach even more people than before. And see, before he was limited to a small con con congregation, but now... Uh, the guy's got thousands of followers, like on his, and I hate to use that word followers. It's like people are following this one man. That's, that's not the case, but uh, he's got a lot more people that he's reaching and ministering to who want to hear a lot of things that he has to say and teach about just because he's become a lot more connected with some of the truth circles and um, truth or communities, I guess, that that are around especially in our local area. But, I mean, the guy's traveled. He's spoken at several conferences in several different states, and it's it's just neat to see that happen. Anyway, um, since he was fired in 2018, his testimony has become an inspiration to a lot of individuals, and we're definitely seeing the fruits from his ministry every day. I tune into him every well, I, I don't know what day he tunes into now. He, he used to tune into every every Thursday on YouTube, um, going going live. And now he's doing something else on on Take on the World TV. It's maybe I'll put some links in the in the comment or in the in the description. But uh, he ended up publishing a book called Fired for Truth that talks about his story. Anyway, let me let me continue. Um, if you look into a lot of these topics and you see that there's a lot of things that people are hiding, that there's a lot of deception in the world, you're going to experience a lot of threats to your reputation too. Because when you start talking about these things, uh, people will start labeling you as like a conspiracy theorist or, you know, easily deceived, things like that. But if you can test and approve the contents of the book, the, the topics I write about, or more, I don't, I don't, I mean, everything's not in the book. You know, there's, you're going to find stuff uh, no matter where you look. So deception is just, I mean, it's everywhere. Um, but then, I mean, if you look into these things, you're going to know what I'm talking about. Along with this information comes a great heaviness. It's like a burden to make others aware. So in turn, you, you might feel led to be that prophetic source or that, um, that source of information to those in your community. And I like to call that ministry an arc builder, an arc builder. Um, and I basically, it 
basically signifies the prophetic ministry of our generation. And I know when you start throwing that word prophet around there, it's, I almost don't even like to use that word because of what mainstream Christianity has made a prophet. They basically made it to where um, the average believer doesn't feel qualified to work in the prophetic or to to they don't you know what i mean because like according to modern mainstream christians you have to be licensed by an organization uh labeled as a prophet by them and invited and paid to speak when you're giving your words of prophecy i've i've been through all that and i've seen it um so consequently it kind of makes people uh, it, it leads the average believer to feel insignificant and not think that they have any type of prophetic ministry when the, you know biblically speaking is when you compare the modern prophets or the modern people the licensed paid you know the ones that i call showcase prophets um to those like such as john the baptist you know what i mean anyway um, it's basically when I use the, the term arc builder, it's I use it to signify those preparing the elect for what is coming. And in, in many cases, what's already occurred. But it's basically a prophetic voice to, to open people's eyes. It's basically to give information. And, and it's as simple as that. Like there, there are things that we see that other people don't see. And. It's very real. I mean, it's so don't like don't think God can't use people to carry information. God has always used different messengers, people who have seen things. That's why he used prophets in the Old Testament. Now, whether you, you um, start getting into, well, did you hear God's voice audibly and stuff? And that's why a lot of times people like to narrow down the prophetic to, well, have you heard God's voice audibly? Then you're not a prophet, you know, and, and that's just not true at all. It's true. A lot of the prophets in the Old Testament, yeah, they did hear the audible voice of God, but uh, that's not always the case. You can't narrow down the the prophetic calling to a single uh, prerequisite, I guess, for for lack of better words. But no, a lot of people today we're we're just carrying information, we're, we're throwing it out there, trying to wake people up, open them people's eyes, and a lot of times in the Bible, that's why God sent His messengers. So. Anyway, the further we go, the more I'm going to elaborate on that dynamic. Crushing conceptualism. It was written to expose the lies of the devil. It was published to make the reader aware of the spiritual wickedness in high places, if any of you know that, that scripture. It's my belief and the belief of those who have become awake to this deception that Satan's blinded the eyes of most professing Christians about our placement in this world. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking, I'm not speaking in terms of salvation or, you know, I'm, I'm speaking more in terms of knowing where we fit into the devil's agenda and not so much God's plan. Isn't that something like a lot of times we, you know, from the pulpits, they talk about how we fit into God's plan and, this is kind of, I'm turning it around. I'm showing you where we fit in the devil's agenda. So I think that's a, a good way of looking at it. For the most part, I mean, Christians understand how we fit into God's plan already as part of his kingdom, you know. And, well, that, that would lead me to another topic. I don't even want to get into that. But for the most part, yeah, we understand how we fit into God's plan. We know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made for God's pleasure as products of his workmanship. Uh, we were made to be reflections of God, the image. Like if you know how Adam was made in the image of God, uh, God designed Adam very specifically. Uh, and of course he failed. He, uh, but, but then God raised up the Messiah who was a man who was called the second Adam, who uh, was also called the image of God, like Adam was, like we are called. I don't know if anybody knows, but uh, mankind is called the image of God. Um, and that's in Old Testament and New Testament. And Jesus was also called the image of God. And <clears throat> we were made to be reflections of God. Uh, we're made to obey him. That's 
kind of, I guess, where I was going with that, where with uh, Christ being the image of God, he was the only man who obeyed God, his father, throughout his entire life, which made him sinless. <laughs> um, and we were put here to seek and save the lost. That's, that's one of the things Jesus said, seek and save the lost. But the devil also has an agenda, a predetermined plot against humanity. And he's relentless to keep Christians blind to that scheme. And part of his tactic is influencing mankind so subtly that we embrace a distorted perception of the world around us. His purpose is to remove biblical absolutes from the equation in efforts to cause us to question our creator. And that goes back to Genesis chapter 3 when the devil first attempted to place question marks where God established periods. And Genesis 1-3 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto thee, to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. And about the title of my book, Conceptualism. Conceptualism is defined as any of several doctrines existing as a compromise between realism and nominalism in regarding universals as concepts. So I guess common synonyms are uh, for conceptual include theoretical, imaginary, or notional. So in essence, conceptualism is the opposite of absolute certainty. It's forming your own concept of reality and your your own preconceived your preconceived ideas of actuality. Um, in just a few moments of time, the devil was able to fabricate a conceptual reality for Adam and Eve to consider. And if this amount of information or deception, if this if this much deception was possible so soon after creation, then how much more could the devil accomplish in 6,000 plus years? Today, immorality has infiltrated the world by taking advantage of every outlet imaginable. Modern society, we are conditioned to make decisions based on what we feel like doing, what we feel like doing, um, at the time, what we, it's almost like a, an initial, you know, we, we want, we want pleasure immediately, you know, and we have basically overlooked and many times we've ignored, I guess, some of, some of the outlets of, in the abstract reality that we've embraced. In other words, we've grown numb to the evil that surrounds us, I guess is a better way of putting it. And I think Paul, it was kind of in his mind, he wrote, uh, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. But when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, the effects were devastating. What it did, it triggered a domino effect a string of evil among humanity. After Adam and Eve left the garden or after they were exiled from the garden, one of the next events that we read about is the murder of Abel. And interestingly, God's response to Cain was that if you do what is right, talking to Cain, if you do what is right, he asked him, well, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And for God to describe sin as crouching at your door, it's kind of frightening. And we're, we're faced with the same reality today. It's the same evil presently at work. It's continual. It doesn't sleep. Today, it seems like we've minimized the severity of spiritual warfare in the church, despite that it's a reality that must be addressed. And through this endeavor, this journey 
um, the same warfare is going to be a common theme. It says in Ephesians 6, 2, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So I just want to leave you with that for the day. That's food for thought. It's good. Uh, we're right about at a half an hour. So um, that's conceptualism, man. And, you know, there's just a lot of things out there that people are missing out on because they don't want to uh, mess with with their reality, with what they've, with their current situation. People are comfortable where they're at and they don't want to budge. And, but I mean, that's why the devil is so good at what he does because he's, he's gotten people there. He's gotten people to become numb to his activity. They, to, to be, they are, they're blind to his activity. So that's what I got for this video. The next one going to be called the compartment of truth. It's going to show how we have uh, compartmentalized ourselves. We and we stay in one compartment. We are right here in the middle, and there's all this information outside. So I hope you like this go around. Um, I'm going to put this on the playlist. And like I've been explaining, each chapter is going to be have its own playlist in the playlist app. And no, that's just to categorize them, to keep them separate. So if you like it, then share it with somebody you know. If, you, if you're thinking of somebody, then, because um, we all are. We, we all think of certain people when we, when we hear or say something or something comes to mind. We, we all have relationships with others, interact with different people, and we want to see people wake up so bad. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, thanks for watching. Give it a like, give it a share, and God bless.